This podcast contains content that may be disturbing to some audiences. Listener discretion is advised. I am like 10 out of 10 excited today because Me too. we are about to interview one of the co-host of probably my favorite paranormal show, Kindred Spirits, is actually one of the shows that I binge-watched in my infamous uh, foot-breaking, accidentally learned I'm a medium story. (laughs) Oh, yeah. (laughs) Yep. Slipped on milk and realized I can talk to dead people. (laughs) Thanks to Kindred Spirits. (laughs) It is my absolute favorite paranormal show, and we'll go into that as to why it is, but I love I'm so excited. I love having the chance to talk to other investigators. So I can't wait. Let's bring him on. Hi. Hi, Adam. <laughs> Hi. How Hi, are Adam. you? Okay. I just did my fangirl moment. I'll calm down now. Okay. Listen, no pressure. I'm <laughs> I fangirl all the time about other people. So I say, <laughs> let it flow. It'll make it, it'll be, it'll be more exciting. <laughs> it is more exciting. Life is better when you're fangirling. Exactly. exactly. Always. Because of the name of your podcast, I wore my new shirt that says I'm a morning person. Oh my gosh, I Which, love that. Right? Because I, I think it matches. Yeah, I think it matches pretty well it with does. the title of your podcast. So that is awesome. I love it. Also, this is completely unrelated, but may I ask who is in the portrait behind you? Um, <laughs> you know, that's a good. So I, we think it might be the wife of Henry Henchy. Uh, which is a famous Provincetown, famous artist. Oh. I think it's Ada Rayner, I believe. Ben was working at a coffee shop in Provincetown, and this uh, old man would come in every morning at the same time and get his coffee. And then one day, he like walked in with his painting and was like, you should have it. Um, <laughs> it's unsigned, but I, I love her look. It's almost like she's sort of looking out for us. and Yeah. I feel like she's looking into my soul, but not in a creepy way. <laughs> no, <laughs> like I think she's there. She's like everyone's grandmother that, you know, she's like I'm every, everyone's grandmother. I don't know. I just, yeah. even, um, sometimes I change out the art based on what we're doing. And I was like, you know what? That seems appropriate. So It does. It's perfect. <laughs> well, you know what? I love her vibe. I feel like Thank she's, you. Here for, she's here for this she's conversation. She's going to whisper in my ear occasionally. And I'm going to be like, oh, oh hey, yep. This is what you should say, that. Adam. <laughs> exactly. And I'll be like, Yes. <laughs> oh, yes, please. So most of our guests know you from the famous show Kindred Spirits uh, and Ghost Hunters. You are the winner of Ghost Academy. Ghost Hunters, yeah, Ghost Academy. Hunters, Ghost Hunters Academy, for sure. And that's what landed you your spot on Ghost Hunters, right? Yeah. So I don't know if I went into depth in the book, but I, I say um, I was at home with Ben watching Ghost Hunters, eating hamburger helper stroganoff. Anyone? I just had that for dinner last night. <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm telling you. So it was like 2010 and or nine. And it said, do you think you have what it takes to be a ghost hunter? And I was, I said, yeah, I do. And so I went down to the internet cafe, 2009, and I filled out the form online and gave him my picture and talked about my Gettysburg experience. And um, about a year and a half later, I got a call that said, you know, we want you on the second cycle of Ghost Hunters Academy. So it was a competition reality show where they took eight cadets and they put them in the most haunted (laughs) places in the country. And it was, uh, they would technically boat someone off the island every episode, right? And uh, (laughs) I made it to the end. I made it to the end and I won that show. It was was me, Michelle Tate, and Eric Baldino right at the end. And I won. And I always say uh, that my prize, you know, technically was like six episodes of Ghost Hunters, which I didn't know there was a cap on it. Um, Mm -hmm. But it was six episodes of Ghost Hunters. But when I showed up and Amy and I got paired together, it was sort of like this match made in uh, uh, ghost heaven. And so we, our, our chemistry was really good and the network was noticing it and the team was noticing it. And I never left. I mean, we, I stayed on for three and a half seasons yeah. and uh, almost four seasons. And it wasn't until after that I, I like looked back at that contract and I was like, what did it actually say? And it was like six episodes. And I was like, well, mm-hmm. I got I bonus doubled points. Back. <laughs> yeah oh i tripled uh, yeah, but probably a hundred and a oh. hundred and twenty something episodes oh I think wow that was on. yeah i mean it's 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 fascinating to think about like it was such a short not a short period of time 
I'm just like, I mean, four years is a long time, but also it's been so long since, like, I think 2014 was the last time we filmed, uh, 20, the end of 2014 was the last time, last time we aired a ghost hunters episode. So it's been uh, 10 years, you know, technically. Mm -hmm. And in that time we, Amy and I got to do kindred spirits. We both have books, uh, you know, we're all working on new things. So it's, it's crazy how time flies and January is already gone. So I don't know what's happening. <laughs> well, it paid off because you and Amy work so well together. And speaking of books, oh, yes, Adam, oh. look, I oh, have your autograph. I pre-ordered it the second I found out about it and, and I've read it and it's fantastic. Thank you. And you know, so those exciting. little, the, that little, um, that little book plate that you have that yeah, I, I signed it in there. Uh-huh. Um, I'm, I'm going to tell you right now, I saw, I literally did sign every single one of those. And then Ben, myself tell. and my two friends, uh, we packed those in envelopes, stamped them, addressed them, mailed them ourselves. So that, so that, cool. has, that has many people's DNA all over. <laughs> That's so cool. I love that your, your husband is so involved with all of it too, because like, and I know he's into the paranormal according to your book. Yeah. We started sure. a group, right? Yeah, well, he and I, um, we lived in province. Well, we, we still do. We live on the Cape. We moved uh-huh. to Truro, which is like one town over. And we lived in Provincetown for like 20 years. And in the winter, as it, as it is now, it's really quiet. Like your activities include uh, going to the post office <laughs> and going to the grocery store. I mean, that's pretty much the thing that you're going to do all day, um, especially in the winter because it's a summer town. And at that, and at that point, uh, back in 2007, 8, 9, we worked our tail off all summer long. And then it was very part-time in the winter because it's a summer community. And we would spend that, that time like uh, looking for ghosts. I mean, doing our hobbies. Uh, we'd watch scary movies. Um, we would, uh, you know, make good dinners, hamburger helper stroganoff. Hamburger helper. You know, we would make, <laughs> right? You know, we were doing something that we like to do a hobby with our friends. And we would go to our friends' uh, houses that they were house sitting. Like, this doesn't happen anymore on the Cape. But it was a time when somebody would say, instead of, you know, uh, draining the pipes, I'm going to allow you to stay here if you pay the utilities um, and keep mm-hmm. watch over the house, right? It's very almost like shining like the whole town wow. turns turns into shining like little caretakers everywhere um so, but we would get access to these houses that were built you know in the 18 early 1800s right. and they had stories cool. and captain's houses and so we would go and sit with recorders and and just see if we could connect with anything on the other side anyone on the other side really um but yeah it, i mean i'm glad he likes it otherwise uh, he'd be really upset when I like bring home like a spooky artifact. He brought home this painting and I was like, that's creepy enough. <laughs> but I have say. like, yeah, <laughs> like, we have, I have, we collect a lot of things and he seems, you know, he seems to be okay with it. As long as he's that's like, cool. if it moves in the middle of the night, I'm going to kill it with fire. It's, it's going. <laughs> I will kill it with fire. I will kill it with gone. fire if it moves at all. <laughs> Boundaries are well, important. No, I love are. that. I love that you guys bonded over that. I also love food and scary movies, but it just, it, that's really sweet that it's part of your relationship because I know that for a lot of people, it can be a strain when your partner isn't mm-hmm. supportive of the work that you do. My yeah. husband hates the spooky, but he's very supportive. He's He bought me all this weird stuff behind me. So <laughs> See, that that it works out. Like I, I feel does. like... I love talking. I love doing what we do, especially, you know, expanding the idea of what uh, paranormal investigation can be and what, what we're really doing when we're looking for ghosts and the ideas behind it and what is a ghost. Um, But I, I love that we can do that year round, you know, and it seems to be okay for the most part. Like people are like, Oh, cool. Right. Like we're into it because everybody gets into it in the fall. Everyone in the fall is like, Right. All in. Right. And I'm like, welcome to our 24 seven, you know, I'm like, (laughs) welcome to a day in the life. Um, But yeah, no, I think our fans are great. And the people that want to have conversations about certain topics, especially ones in the book. And speaking of your book, I loved it. And I feel like it's such a a good thing for people who might be struggling with a loss. Why was (laughs) it important for you to write this book? I had been thinking about this idea for quite a while. 
um, just getting it on paper, basically. Like, I don't, I don't know if anybody believes in zodiac signs and anxiety, but I'm a Pisces and I have anxiety. <laughs> and like, I, uh, I know you about know, anxiety, I have lots of, I'll tell you that. Right. And I have lots of thoughts in my head, right? And sometimes, you know, those thoughts can get the best of you. And the best way for me to process those is to like write them down or like come up with something that kind of fleshes out that idea. And so when I was thinking about writing, a book per se a few years ago, I didn't just want to write an ordinary ghost book, meaning I didn't just want it to have a collection of, uh, you know, how to stories, how to investigate, like, and those, those are fine. Those are absolutely fine. Right. But I feel like everybody's done that. Everybody who is smarter than I, <laughs> you know, in a way has done that book. Like people have written those books. And so for me, I said, what about what we know from the other side to better help us understand our own grief, our own loss, our own mortality. Can those ideas help us uh, in understanding uh, the hardest part of this journey, this life journey that we're going on? And when I started thinking about those ideas, uh, it made sense to me. Don't get me wrong. It does have really great true stories. It, the book does talk about some of our cases and like explores them a bit deeper. The overall idea was to help the living understand the dead uh, by in turn helping the dead understand themselves. I don't know. Hopefully a ghost right. will pick up the book. It's a layered thing. And when I started writing it, um, uh, it was tough. It was very tough because you're thinking about, you know, death and what is that all the time. Uh, especially when you're diving into something that you're writing, like a manuscript or chapters, and and you have to really meditate on like, well, what was that experience like? How do I process that? Um, and at times it was pretty an anxiety inducing um, because you're you're cracking open something that as humans we work so hard to shut out. Right. You know, we're the only species I. Well, I don't know if we're the only species, but we're a, a species that knows it's coming, right? It's one thing you can't escape. But we do yeah. all of our best to block it out, you know? And so I think sometimes it can be beneficial to open that, you know, box up and look at what the contents are and process it for yourself and then put it away back under the bed, right? Don't do it all at once. Yes. Right. I think this book is a is a good way for people to read a chapter, meditate on it, read another chapter, meditate on it. I've had people tell me, you know, I loved the book and I wanted to get through it, but there was so much that I wanted to absorb from each chapter that I had to stop, take journal notes. I wrote things down. I, I talked to my friends about it. And then I continued on to the next chapter. Yep. And then you have the the ones that are glutton for, you know, they just want everything. And so they read it in a day and then they're like, <laughs> whoa, me. my head is blowing up. <laughs> and I have to go back yeah. and read it again. But, um, but yeah, I mean, that was the whole idea. It was to write something that meant more to me than just my experiences. And I wanted it to help other people. Which I think it does a fantastic job of. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I thought that I was going to binge read your book, mm. which is normally how I do things. There are there are a lot of I've read plenty of paranormal books. I read a lot of novels, and I was one of the latter. I stopped and I journaled and I made tarot exercises <laughs> for myself yeah, based for sure. on the contents of your book chapters because there's so much in there and you're right it is something like death is always on our minds and it is something that we like to like we're aware of and we want to stop it and we mm -hmm. also want to pretend like yeah. it's not a thing all at the same time and you address it all so beautifully thank you so many people are scared of death you make it seem in such a way that people don't need to be scared. This is what this is this is just a part of life and there are so many beautiful things about death mm -hmm. that you put into the book that I think are fantastic. And I think that's why it's so good for people who are mourning. Yeah, I, I think, you know, it, it's scary still. Mm -hmm. Right? It's always sure. gonna yeah. be it's a little unknown that sure. sits in the back pocket of your of your mind. And when you're faced with something like uh, you know, the loss of a loved one or or, you know, any sort of like scare or whatever. It's, it's, it's one of those things where you start to process what that means. For some people, it's too, it's too late to start the process. You know, when you get to that point, yep. it's like, 
It's like start thinking about it now in tiny, beautiful ways. And then that. when it gets, if it, like, God forbid, you know, it, you know, you lose a parent or a, 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 a pet, even when you get to that, you've sort of laid the groundwork for the journey that is to come. Right. And I think that's very important for people to think about. Um, somebody asked me, I think back in July before the book came out and they were like, well, they're like, you wrote this book and you know, are you scared of death? And it took me a second and I was like, Ooh, well, I mean, it would be foolish of me not to be sure. You know what I'm saying like right. foolish, it's natural. foolish. Yeah. I'm more concerned for those that I would leave behind mm-hmm. now, I guess that because what I've learned from the afterlife is there's a great line in into the woods where the witch says when the baker's wife dies and the witch goes, when you're dead, you're dead. And it's so cold, Mm -hmm. you know, but it was almost like, and I don't mean that in the sense that there is nothing after. I just mean that it's, that's, that's the next door. Like that's the step to the next journey, right? It's done. And I think a lot of people, especially those that don't stay behind are on that journey. They're, they're, they're gone. Mm -hmm. This world is not for them anymore and they've left and, you know, we grieve and mourn here. So I sort of think about, you know, uh, I'm more concerned with those, I guess, that are still living once it, once it happens. I don't know what happens to us after we die. I've talked to plenty of ghosts and I'm, I'm always the first to say, I don't know what happens and I'm okay with not knowing. I know some people stay. I know some people don't stay, but that does see, tend to be what I think about the most is who would, or the people that would potentially miss me. Um, and mm-hmm. you actually told a story it was in one of the early chapters of your book about a friend who did manage to communicate after they had passed on. Have yeah. you had many experiences like that? Well, my grandmother uh, showed up to me in a dream, a dream visitation, which I talk about in a big chapter. And um, to me, that is the closest I've come to ever having a loved one or a friend speak to me and and talk to me about what is in the afterlife. Um, And when Mm -hmm. I talk about dream visitations, I'm not talking about a dream where you're the passenger, you're in a dream where you are the driver. There is absolutely no question in your mind that this is real, that it's happening, that you are in control completely. And those that have had those dreams know exactly what I'm talking about. I've had one with my grandma too. Yeah. And in those dreams, loved ones sometimes come back and they speak to you. Um, And so much so where you can feel the texture of their skin, you can smell them, you are viscerally in a space with them, and you know that it is real. And so that, to me, that experience uh, led me to believe that wherever my grandmother was, or wherever she was at at the time, she was good. She was okay. And she had a job to do. I think she said to me, you know, I make deliveries. And I was like, I don't know, what does that mean? And so after I woke up, I was sort of thinking like, oh, deli- like angels, delivers of messages, like the Greek Anglos is messenger. Like, oh, and, and that she, what, what was she doing? She was delivering a message to me, you know, she came back to yeah. me. And, um, you know, but my friend Yvette, She had a similar experience where a friend of hers who passed away suddenly came back um, multiple times. And each time he returned, he looked better and better and better. And the first time he he was with her, she was freaking out. And she was like, this isn't real. This can't be real. You're you're dead. Like, this is not good. And he goes, I'm going to come back and tell you something. You're not ready. And he comes back and he tells her. Uh, you know, I uh, you, you, to let you know that this is real, I need you to talk to your partner and tell them about a gig that we played. There were musicians, a gig that we played in Vermont. This specific thing happened. She woke up, told him. He's like, how do you know that? That makes no sense. And then we go on to learn that the next dream she has, he delivers a message about the way he passed on, said, please deliver it to my family. It was an accident. It was not on purpose. Um, and all of these friends that were, you know, that were grieving around his death that Yvette knew, got that closure from that experience. And then he went on to also talk about, you know, it's beautiful. He was like, but I can't, I don't, the afterlife is beautiful, but I don't have the words. There are no words in the English language to describe what it is. And I thought about that for a minute after she told me, and I was thinking about like, what are my thoughts on this whole experience? And I was like, uh, 
what it, like oh of course he can't describe it of course he can't describe you know i was getting angry about it but then i was thinking you know that's the way it should be because if we could describe it in full terms where everyone 1000% believed it existed this life would no longer mean what it means to us mm-hmm. right, right. You're right. Would, this journey that we're on we would be like oh, well the other journey the other journey <laughs> You know, somebody would capitalize off of it. Like there would be like, it would just be weird. And I think that's the point. The point is for us to process this journey and this experience so that in the next, we have things to bounce off of and to like, you know, push us forward. Um, I do have a a quick story to tell you that I I tell a couple of times, but I have to tell you really quick because you mentioned the audio book. So get this. For those of you who haven't read the book, this is a spoiler alert, but it's going to make the story so much more amazing. We, uh, my friend Yvette told me that story in 2008 before I was, I I was a hobby, ghosting was a hobby, and then I got on Ghost Hunters. I wanted to record the audiobook myself, and they gave me a bunch of different locations, but none were in Boston. And that's because I live on the Cape, and I said, Cape Cod, and I said, can I please do it somewhere in Boston? It's the summer. It would be so much easier if I could just drive there and drive back. They're like, yeah. So I recorded in a place uh, in Arlington. And uh, this is right outside of Boston. And uh, when I, it took me like four days to do four different days throughout the summer to do the, the audiobook. And then my I worked with the same person. And uh, we got to talking and he was like, I went to Berkeley. And I was like, Oh, I went to Boston Conservatory, Berkeley and Boston Conservatory shared a cafeteria. Yvette went to Berkeley. This gentleman, her friend who passed away also went to Berkeley. Um, and we got to know each other. And like, we had the same sort of like weird memories of like the cafeteria and it was such a great working relationship when we got to like the the third day he was like you know i'm taking i usually take the month of august off to be with my kids before they go back to school so i have another engineer that's going to come in and finish it he's great and we had just finished the first part of chapter 11 which is the dream chapter and i said oh you know I really wish you would be here because chapter 11 is one of my favorite. And I started ex- describing this story that my friend Yvette told that like she went to Berkeley and like blah, 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 blah. And I had changed, um, I had changed this gentleman's name in the book uh, to Patrick just for the sake of his family and whatever. Um, but yeah. I'm telling the story and he looks at me and he goes, Peter. <laughs> and I said, yes. And I pause because I'm, I'm like, Peter, he says, and I'm like, Yes. And he goes, Peter was my best friend. Oh, and I like, gosh. I pause because no. at this point I'm like, okay. And he goes, everything that you're telling me, there was uncertain, there was circumstances around his death. We didn't know. I was like, and, it, and yes, it snowed uh, on his wake and we were all there. And I was like, did you know Yvette? And he goes, no, that we lit, we were in different circles. So I, he um, didn't know Yvette, but this, this friend knew these two circles of friends. They were all there. They all experienced. He goes, he was supposed to play my wedding two weeks after he died. And he died no. two weeks before I got married. And I'm standing there looking at him. And I am like, not sweating, but like floored by the universe's gift and connection out of the thousands of people i could have recorded this book with i'm sitting in the studio of someone whose best friend came back in a dream to another friend of mine told her everything that she needed to know she then in turn told me she told all of her friends and i put it in book form this guy his job is to record audiobooks. There is zero chance he would have picked up this book there is zero chance full Body chills right now. There is zero so, chance he okay. would have grabbed this book off the shelf and been like, let me read this ghost book. He's not into it, right? He's there right. to do a job. And all of a sudden, I am telling this story about his best friend who died oh two weeks before his wedding. And there was all this uncertainty about his death. And, the, you know, and they, they were confused and, and they didn't know. And this gentleman who passed away made it a point to make sure that every single one of his friends found out. So not only did he vet know and tell all of those friends, but I put it into a book form in which he went home immediately. And he was like, you know what? I'm going to finish this audio book with you. He <laughs> finished the whole book with me. He went uh-huh. home immediately, read that chapter. I'm sure he told all of those other set of friends about it. So everyone knew. This closure happens 
15 to 18 years afterwards. So when you think that about is, the universe setting uh, up something from a catastrophe, like maybe he right. knew where my, what my future was going to be. So he dropped uh -huh. a nugget for Yvette and that's why Yvette was chosen. But maybe he also knew, no, 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 this is the trajectory. I need you to tell him because this happens right. in 2023. Right. Isn't that yeah. Amazing. It that blows is so my amazing. Mind. <laughs> it blows my I have mind. so many goosebumps. It's just I the too. odds of all of those lining up are like, and the fact that it's not his real name and that his actual friend was sitting there, like, are you talking yeah. about my best friend right now? And you're yeah. like, how did you? How did you know right. that? Because it's not his real name. Like, <laughs> and I literally said, well, I oh. said to him, I was like, well, I changed his name to Patrick because I didn't want to affect. And then and that's when he looked at me and goes, Bleh. and he like says uh -huh. the name. And I was oh, like. Wow. But doesn't mm, that just sorry. go to show that there is an afterlife, that this isn't the only place for us and that the universe is at work putting all this together so that we can create these beautiful experiences. And I think that's mm -hmm. just the most perfect right. story to tell about that's all the there. example it, it blows my mind yeah. when i tell people that it's hard to fully comprehend it's hard to really fully comprehend the the massiveness of that synchronicity right that weird that is paranormal yo i mean oh. that go, uh, ghosts are one thing supernatural and paranormal forms itself in many different ways and that to me is like one of the one of the weird coolest well, yeah. beautiful stories ever did he know that that was going to be your life path because like if you think back on that time of your life like mm -hmm. did you even think that you could end up here <laughs> no i mean that, that wasn't the truth i think uh what's interesting about what, what i do now i think what's interesting is like i don't think i had a choice right i think i was at the right place at the right time and a hobby became a career i, I also think like somebody knew something i didn't know my entire life growing up to a certain point was like musical theater. I went to school for theater. I grew up in Alabama. I loved theater and I went to school. For, I went to college for musical theater. So at some point, something big had to intervene that trajectory in order for me to even consider the other idea and which was happened at Gettysburg. I mean, if that had not happened, um, I could have been a six-time Tony winner, but you know what? It's fine. Um, <laughs> you would have been. Still can. Listen, still can. Because I've um, heard you like, sing, Adam. Thank you. Thank you. Y you and your husband, and you guys are amazing. <laughs> well, you know, the album, wait, she's telling this. I was just going to ask. Oh, the, oh album, the album's coming. She's like, the album's coming. Yeah, I, I, I don't think <laughs> I had the choice. And I think what, what's interesting, at the time she told me that, I was into the paranormal, and that's why she shared it with me, right? Like my friends would have spooky things happen in, in um, when they lived in New York or like in their apartment. And then we'd talk about it because it was fun to talk about. It was like sure. an exciting thing to discuss. Right. And now, you know, it still is exciting to discuss, but I just, I've seen a lot of things in the past 15 years and I know a lot of things and has it been 15 years? How long of it? How old am I? I don't know. A long time. <laughs> and so it's like, it's like, you know, I, I think there's, um, there's more, thought put into it right we're not just throwing spaghetti at the wall and seeing what sticks well you're so good at what you do and you're so empathetic and i think that's why you get the result you and amy both get the results that you do on kindred spirits and i have to say that i love um that show so much because not only do you get the evidence and the you know you collect all that but you ask the questions why are you here mm -hmm. and how can we help <clears throat> not just yeah. the living but the dead and yeah. so many paranormal shows on TV right now are just about getting the spooky and collecting the evidence, but there's so much more to it than that. Yeah, I, I think, you know, there's an evolution that I talk about in the book where it's, you start at the excitement level, like when you have an experience uh, and, you, and it's paranormal in nature, it's so exciting and you want more of it. It's like this little drug, right? And you're like, oh, I want more experiences. I want more of this. Because it's so fascinating. But then when you start to realize what's on the other side of the activity where you're, you are humanizing the spirits, you are talking to a mother, a grandmother, a father, a sister, a brother, an aunt, someone who's passed away, who is just like us. And for some reason, they're in uh, spirit form in our world, which is not made for them, right? This world is made for the living. And it may be very hard for them to communicate and to understand. And 
the only thing they can do is knock, right? But there's mm -hmm. obviously something that they need behind it. I saw that glitch, your camera glitch. My, I Am saw I that too. Here? You're here. <gasps> yeah. Can you hear I us? I can't see it. I can hear you, but I can't see anything. I can see you. We can see you, that but your camera so glitch. This is not the first yeah. time, yo, this is not the first time this has happened when I do interviews about the book. <laughs> I anyway, can't see you, so, but I can hear you. So It's fine. We're here. We're not ghosts. We're still here. Um, <laughs> oh my, I've never I had this happen before. The last time this ever. happened when I was talking about the book, my audio went out and I, I charge this stuff all day long. I'm prepared. Honey, I come to work prepared. And so <laughs> I, I'm like, when things go wrong, I tend to not think it's mechanical. It's a glitch because I do these all the time. And I'm like, mm -mm, no, no, no. Somebody's trying to say something. Um, <laughs> My dog so, is, is like, he's, can you hear me? Can you see me? Oh yeah, we he's, can see you. He, the hair is standing up on the back of his head and he's like standing watch. Like if there's anyone in that room, knock over something. Knock I'm like, over mm, knock over the license plate, ghost in the room. Do you have any of your devices turned on, Melissa? No, why don't I? Oh my gosh, I we usually, usually do. have something running in the background. At least a record. Well, we are recording audio, so if anybody's it's listening audio. and captures EVPs in the background, time write down the time code and put it in the comments. <gasps> yes, yeah. I've been waiting right? for the day when we have an EVP on on the episode. Should I get out my equipment? Yeah, get out of, get out something. Yeah, turn your REM pod on. Yeah, put a K2 on that back table on your, like, to the right of the Bigfoot foot, near the Bigfoot foot, and that way we can see it. The Bigfoot big foot, foot. foot. The Bigfoot foot. K2. Yes. Yeah, great. Okay. Now put, yeah, put it right there. Oh, perfect. Is it on? You see it? Yep. It's Is on. it on? Yep. Great. If it lights right. up, we'll see it. Is it going to go off? Oh, my God. We're all going to just be sitting looking at the... I know. We'll have to. Oh, she's got her REM pod too, so that'll beep and that'll tell us for sure if it's the REM uh, pod or what I like to call the most annoying piece of equipment in paranormal. It is. It really is. <laughs> it's so bad, and like when it trips and it doesn't go off. I still can't see you guys. Well, we I, we can see you, and you okay, look cool. completely relaxed, like nothing <laughs> is wrong. You look like you have not seen a ghost. See? What's going on? Yeah, yellow lights on. Oh, this is so exciting. Ooh, see, now we're going to I feel like it's your life. painting. I'm not going to lie. I've been I've been staring at her. We've been making eye contact. I don't oh. know who she is, but I love her. <laughs> what if I, like, turn yes. away? Like, what if I turned away towards the painting, and then the next time I turned back towards you, I was her? That would be <laughs> wild. It would be so crazy. Oh, now it's green. Now it's yellow. Okay, wait. If there's anyone in the room with Dr. Melissa Morgan... Can you please light up the REM pod that's behind her? That little black box with the red top. Make it go off so I can hear it. I can't believe that I'm ghost hunting with Adam Perry. <laughs> it's not going to do it. Okay, well, listen, whoever's in there with, with Dr. Morgan, if you want to get our attention, I just... Oh, wait. Okay, wait. Your camera just glitched again, and then that thing in it, the back is, like, flashing. See it? It is. Yep. Yep. And yep. her camera glitched. Did you see it? I did oh, see it. Yeah. That's the temperature drop. There is oh, 100% something happening. That's wild. Okay, I've had this on, by the way, Adam, for all of our interviews. I think most of them, anyway. And yeah. we haven't had anything. So, Well, you know yeah, what I was doing, cool. though? I was talking, if you notice what I was talking about, I was talking about the humanization of spirits. Oh, right? yes. We're not yes. talking about, like, a goat, like... This on my shirt is a cartoon of a ghost, right? We're, uh -huh. we're not talking about that. We are literally talking about someone who's passed away. I don't know if she's dead. Forgive me if she's not. But like, you know, like <laughs> we're not talking about just an, uh, an imaginary friend. We're talking about someone who lived like you and I, and they're on the other side. It's hard for them to communicate. And the, you know, our evolution from having experiences, which is what we're doing now. We're having experiences, right? You're having an experience right now. Is, is is changed from that to why is the experience happening? 
And what is it that they need or want? Because that nine times out of 10, that's what it is. You know, there is There are the few spirits who hang around who are like looking after their legacy, right? But in a sense, they want something too. They want to right. make sure that their legacy is intact. They want to make sure their hotel is running properly, right? Um, but there are other people that are more desperate, like they need to get a message out or they're the, the, like on Kindred, their, their tombstone, uh, their headstone is wrong, misspelled and it's right. not where it should be. Or uh, there's mold in the attic and the lady who died from the mold, from the lung complications from the mold in the house wants to warn the family about it. Right. Those things happen, but it's all out of a need or a want. And once you start doing that, ghosts don't become that Hollywood scary anymore. You know, right. um, I, 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 people are always like, you went to, oh, it's going off. It's agreeing yeah, it, with me. It is yep. agreeing with you. Oh, okay. I even have beeps. Oh, I'm thrilled. If it's annoying, I'll turn oh. it off. But I mean, let's, it's two seconds. Great. Let's, doctor, 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 <laughs> doctor, why don't doctor. you ask one, a question since we're humanizing ghosts, like, do you have an, uh, could it be anything connected to your house or to the objects behind you or to someone in your life? Uh, I, I do have a couple of people who have passed on. I mean, I feel like maybe ask a couple and see if we get any responses. Then if nothing happens, we can turn it off. Okay. All right. Can you quiet that for just a moment and I'll ask a question. It is stop. Okay. There we go. Is this Brandon? If they're Brandon, could you please light up the the black box with the red light on top? The camera glitched. Camera, camera glitched it again. Did? Yep. It did. Yep. I still can't see you guys. Um, it's okay, but I take that as like potential evidence I, because it's it's manipulating electronics, which is what it's doing with true. that that true. thing behind you. Yeah. Is this? Oh, I was oh, just going to say if this was my dad. Okay, so sometimes when we're investigating, you've already thought of the question in your head. Mm -hmm. And you're about to speak it out loud. But before you can speak out loud, it answers because it's already heard what you were going to ask. Again, they live in an environment that is not, you know, they True. potentially can manipulate and know what you're energetically putting out there. True. Could be oh your father. Gosh. I mean, Crazy. I would say the actual equipment going off and you thinking about saying it, I'm not saying it is your father, but like I would lean and if I were investigating with you right now, like all night, I would lean in that direction and see if you got more activity because you're specifically asking for them to manipulate something in the space with you rather than uh -huh. it being a camera glitch, if that makes sense. Right. Sure. Yep. Camera glitch oh, can this. maybe be explained, but like that thing behind you that's never gone off is but going off, especially when you talk about your dad. So. There we go. We're talking it about my dad. very active. That's crazy. You know, Adam, you were talking about humanizing spirits, and you talk a lot about that in your book. Mm -hmm. Can you go into that a little bit more in more sure. detail, maybe? Sure. How are you feeling, Melissa? Are you freaking um, out? No, I'm not freaking out, but I can't see you guys, and so I'm like, I don't know where to look. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you're fine. No, you're doing perfectly It's fine. weird because this is the second time that we've done an interview. I, we interviewed a, a psychic medium um, and she actually was able to channel my dad and I've never, ever been able to mm. channel him before, but I've always had so many questions around. What was his name? Wayne. Wayne, you're in, you're in luck. I don't channel. So <laughs> if you're sorry. So if you're thinking this is one of those moments, it won't happen, but I appreciate you. And if you want us, I, I'd love to continue this interview, maybe, and then uh, Melissa can talk to you later, if that's okay. Is that yes. okay? That sounds like a great idea. Because I, um, unfortunately, my psychic powers aren't that strong. I do have a few things, but not like that. So, I appreciate it. I think what's interesting, though, think of it, let's think of it this way. Like, obviously, I don't know if it's your dad, but let's, let's think of, you said humanizing the ghost. Let's think about that mm -hmm. for a second. Like, I don't know if it is your father. Mm-hmm. How awesome and wonderful is it, would it be if it were true? Like, if that is true, like it, your dad has just come to pop in for a minute because he hears what we're discussing. And for some exactly. reason, 
he's drawn to the conversation and he's like, I agree with that. Like, yes. I mean, it, it gives me the idea. Like he seems to be somebody who, uh, Oh, now we're losing Carly. <gasps> no way. Yeah. She Do is we- on a death wheel. Like it's just spinning. Oh. <gasps> Yo! This is so it's crazy. Happening right now. My mouse isn't even working. I can't even. I would restart just because we have time. Like, just you know. Okay. Are you okay with that, Adam? Yeah, I'm fine. I'm gonna okay. I'll I'll be right back. We've angered Melissa, the spirit. Um, Melissa, I would say turn off that the REM pod. Can you see us now? Yeah. yeah. Turn, turn it, it off, off because here's the thing: if if your dad is there or whoever it might be, have a one-on-one conversation and just be like, "Hey, if you're here." Um, just acknowledgement, right? And saying, uh, I'd love to know what you need. So if you give me a sign at some point about what you need or what you want, that, that would be great. I'm not a big fan of investigating my own space because then I feel like it gives them permission to continue to reach out, you know? So it's, it's sure. good to set boundaries, just like with human, speaking of humanizing spirits, like when people have a haunting in their house, the best way that I say for people to sort of take control of that is to literally set boundaries as if, they were house guests, you know, uh, you don't allow people who visit your house to like bang on your wall in the middle of the night. Right. So why right. would you take that? Like, it would be like, listen, you can be here. Like I always say, or not like whatever you want to say, but I was like, listen, it's okay for you to be here. But when my family's here, I don't want to see you or hear you. If I'm here alone, mm-hmm. sure. Interact with me. Now, I'm, if there's anybody in this house right now, th- I'm not talking to you. I'm just saying an example <laughs> because I don't like <laughs> To bring my work home, <laughs> if that makes sense. So I say do that, Melissa. Like once we're done, have a one-on-one heart to heart. Okay. You know? And maybe there is something that you that's been weighing on you that he knows and he just want to talk about. Like, I don't know. That's an idea. There actually is. I've been really struggling with something. Well yeah. <clears throat> not saying I'm psychic, but <laughs> <laughs> well, one of our other guests that we had on the show, her name is Courtney. She runs an account called The Ghoul Guide. Wonderful person. Oh, Courtney. Yeah, I know Courtney. She's fantastic. But we had her on and we had a wonderful conversation. She is so much fun. But she also referenced an episode of Kindred Spirits where y'all were talking about an egregore. I was wondering if we are humanizing spirits. And if we are potentially creating egregores, can you tell the difference? Yeah. So um, an egregore or a tulpa is something that theoretically is created by our own manifestation and energy. There's a thing called the Philip experiment. It was done in the 70s. If you want to Google that, that's the best way to describe what an egregore is. Carly just did a whole episode on that. Right. So you know what I'm talking about. So the thing Uh is... um, the, uh, you know, the most famous uh, case on Kinder Spirits is at the Oliver House. It was the um, Zombie Boy episode. Now, the thing about yeah. that, we walked into that space knowing the historic nature of that house, right? We know that it was connected to the Revolutionary War. I actually just investigated there uh, like three weeks ago, three weekends ago. And I, I focused specifically just on the Revolutionary War and the people that were there got an incredible EVP because they were Tories, basically. They they wanted the, they still, uh, what's the, what are the word I'm looking for? They wanted the king to still be the king. They didn't want the revolution uh-huh. to happen, right? They were loyalists. Loyalists, yeah. that's right. And mm-hmm. so I got a great EVP where I was like, finish this phrase, God save the, and it, it says king, right? Oh, it was wow. like right there, right? But the thing is, when we showed up, we had one expectation but it flipped because Christy, who was uh, leading us through the house, she started talking about how in a certain room upstairs, they see a ghost a f- photo of a child or they take pictures in this mirror and, and there's, they see a child and we call him zombie boy. We call him zombie boy. And they've been doing that for a few months. I don't know how long, actually. I mean, I feel like it was a few months at least. Um, and the thing is, the pictures that people were taking in the, fo- in, in the mirror weren't actually pictures of uh, a ghost, right? Nine times out of 10, I, I'd say 9.9 times out of 10, a, a photograph is not a ghost. It's not paranormal. I've only seen maybe three or four out of thousands in my entire career. And so when you take it, the mirror's warped, your brain is uh, trying to make sense of it. it uh, it's called pareidolia. It's like making shapes out of clouds. 
and you are they're saying oh i got the zombie boy 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 right and so you have all these people going into this house this specific room really throwing their manifestation out that there is this kid here his name is zombie boy and his face is deformed well we started investigating and i was sitting at the mirror and amy was doing the ss method she was listening to the spirit box blindfolded asking questions and she was in the um uh, in the bathroom where Christy had created a uh, scrying mirror through a red light. And she was sort of saying what she heard. And the conversation that I was having was very much, uh, it, it seemed like this entity or this spirit, this whatever, um, didn't really know what it was. It couldn't tell me specifics about their life, but was like, I was invited here. It was very weird and specific. Uh-huh. And our first thought wasn't, you know, Agrigor, Tulpa, but I was like, oh, but what if though? Like, what if this is this kind of thing? And so what we did is we spent a really long time giving this Tulpa attributes. So we made up an entire uh, thing about him. We gave him a place where he could live. We talked about his life, how he died, how his father died, uh, where he was buried, who his mother was, sister, brother, like all of these people. Um, and we would sit across from each other in this room and we would just talk. And I would say to Amy, was like, oh yeah, and he passed away. He fell off a horse and hit his head and he died. And she goes, yeah, you know, and his dad died in the Civil War and they threw a huge parade for him. And I was like, yeah, and he's buried next to his mother. Her name was, and his sister, his name was, and his father, his name was, right? So we do this for a very, very long time. And then we leave it. We exit. Mm. The weird thing about this is when we were investigating the carriage house the next day, Chip, who was remote reading from his house in Atlanta, Georgia, we're in Massachusetts. He is in Atlanta, Georgia. He says something to us on the phone because we were like in a space and we were like, can you just get a vibe of the space? And he kept saying, he was like, the Civil War. I don't get it. There's something about the Civil War. And I was like, (laughs) holy heck. What? Okay. So then we were like, oh, no, no, this is weird. Like, why would he say that? That makes no sense. There's no civil war here. It's revolutionary war. So we go back upstairs and we start getting EVPs where this this entity is answering questions. The, The answers that he is telling us matches exactly what we were giving it right what's interesting is i went back there and and they don't talk about it anymore which is exactly what we asked them not to do like you should just let it go and focus on the history of the space uh and it'll eventually dissipate now i just investigated there i didn't see no zombie boy i don't have any evps that gave me to believe that zombie boy is still there because once you take the power and the intention and manifestation away from it it's we believe theoretically that it dissipates and goes away but what did come to me was people that lived during the Revolutionary War who lived in that house. So how do you know the difference between am I talking to a made-up ghost through energy and manifestation, or am I talking to somebody who was once living like us? The best way that I know how to tackle that is research, right? We research and historically check everything about a property. We pull deeds, land surveys. I mean, we are doing the work because when factual information matches up to paranormal, uh, paranormal activity and they, they, they collide, then the odds of it being real and true, it, it, it heightens, it, right? You have factual information, mm-hmm. you have names, you have all this stuff. We're pulling up information that people might have not talked about or known about for over, for a very, very long time. So no one's sitting in that house talking about, uh, Jacob Marley, who lived in like 750, 1750, you know, who owned this property and this land. But we're talking about it, right? So the odds of an aggregor knowing that information is none, right? Because no one is talking about it. No one's manifesting right. using that information. So we, when once we start asking questions, factual information that nobody has known, and the spirits are giving us the answers based on the inf- factual information I have in my hand, we're like, odds are it's it's a spirit right and you can tell right. though there was an aggregate we we encountered it at belvoir winery and it kept saying his name was uh he goes my name's robert chip asked him what his name was chip coffee and he goes robert uh-huh. and chip was like that's my name that's not your name it didn't know what its name was it didn't know what its purpose oh. was and so it kept it kept trying to feed off of our fears like it kept doing things to us because it knew what scared us like disembodied voice in amy's ear um, Amy uh-huh. and I separated and our walkies wouldn't work. And like one thing is I, I love to be oh, in contact creepy. with each other. Like, and it sort of uh-huh. like took that away from us, but it couldn't do anything else. It right. played with our fears because we, if we talked, if we said our fear out loud, it was like, boop, I got that. 
I'm going to use it against mm-hmm. you. Right. So mm-hmm. John Tenney was on that case and John, John like cleared his head. He was like blank slating his mind and tried to be as neutral as possible. And nothing weird happened to him. Like chips, uh, one of chips, big things is like, he really, you know, demonic entities are things that are really aggressive that are non-living. Um, it's a, I mean, it's a thorn in anybody's side, but he doesn't like it, right? If he gets that kind of right. vibe, he's like, no, 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 right? But he had talked about that. And so it started uh-huh. presenting itself like that. That's the most basic explanation of something like that. Um, and again, it's all theory, right? But theory yes. and practice, when you talk about the Philip experiment, it was theory and practice and it worked. And then at the Oliver House, that was insane to me. I've never seen anything like it. It's something I will never, ever forget. And it's something that I think about all the time when I go and investigate. I, I have to be like, litmus test this ghost. It's like, okay, well, what am I dealing with? Tell me your name. I'm not going to give you a name. I'm gonna, what is it? You know? Uh-huh. And if it's like, I don't know, then you're uh-huh. like, <laughs> why don't you know? Uh-huh. You, you know, like, why don't you know your name? Did enough people wander in here and say, this place must be haunted, that then something... Right. Right. Exactly. Up. That's the other thing. It's like, if you go into... You know, and you're like, oh, this place is so creepy. It's so haunted. It's so haunted. It's so haunted. Well, guess what? It's going to be haunted, right? It's going to be haunted. Surprise. Right. right. Yeah. You did a whole chapter on near-death experiences, and that's yeah. what I did my thesis on. And so, it really fascinates me. And and most people who talk about their near-death experiences, uh, you know, have that light in the tunnel, and they go through the tunnel and, and all this. But John had a totally different experience. And there are a few other people that I've interviewed that have had the same sort of experience. Do you think that we have control over what that is? I'm hesitant to say what I 100% believe, because what if what I believe now is not what I believe in 20 years, and I've set the motion this scenario, right? What I'd like to point out, though, in that scenario and in that story, John really didn't believe in anything. He sort right. of was his own person and his own thing. And that's totally fine. But when he got when he had his near death experience, and he was in that space of nothingness, where he existed before he existed now, and he will always exist where he's existing with everything. The one thing that's a point that sticks out to me is the loneliness that he was feeling. He wanted to scream out to other people so other people could hear him because he didn't want to be alone. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think for him deep down, even as a teenager, he didn't want to be alone. Right. He he lived, he was a loner. You know, we all know those kids and I was one at one point and I was too, but then you're like, but what happens if this becomes your forever, you know? And I, and I think it is a beautiful idea that as a, li- a living person in this journey, that we cultivate our dream of what will be, and we hold on to what we want it to be, and it gives us faith that there is something else, even if you don't believe in ghosts, that you will see your family, that you will experience it. And I think it's such a beautiful thing to daydream that, yeah, let's think of it that way, right? Instead of being told what the afterlife is, let it be what we want it to be based on our own human experience and our own journey. Um, and I know, and don't get me wrong, like people that are listening who are Christian or Catholic or Hindu or uh, Buddhist, like everyone has their own ideas and views based on religion of what the afterlife is. is. And you've been told that this is the way it is based on scripture and text. And if that is what you believe, that is absolutely fine. Like you can believe that there will be a beautiful paradise and all of your friends will be there. Like I love that. I want that sounds amazing. Right. Right. Exactly. But then again, uh, who knows? I mean, it's self, it's, it's, we, I mean, my brain, I'm spiraling, I'm ADD spiraling now, but it's like my brain goes (laughs) to like, we are the speck of the unit. We are so small. We are the utter, we are the, I can't even put into work again. (laughs) I cannot describe, I can not put into words, what we are in this universe that we live in. What if we are uh, Horton? Here's the who, and we're a speck on a piece. We're a piece of dust on a fluff that he's this elephant's right. walking around. You know, it's like who knows? Who knows? Right? It, it's so beyond comprehension that I wrote a book about it. So I feel <laughs> so that so that we all can be like completely immersed in self thought and exploration. You know, and I do think, by the way, I I think I I don't want anyone at home to be like, oh, no, I think the afterlife is this. I'm now stuck. 
please. <laughs> please. I feel like we can, we can change our mind about what we want for dinner. We can change our mind about how we want the afterlife based on our experiences. Yeah, do we want hamburger helper or not? Yeah. Always. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to prefer like open bar, no hangover. <laughs> <laughs> all my friends, you know what I'm saying? All my Same. friends, yeah. you yeah. know, I like, I want to be able to like ride some rides, like go to Disney. Like I want to, I want to be yeah. able to free float, but who knows? I don't know. And all the dogs in the world, I get to all have dogs. in my possession. All of them. And they, when they, poo- when they poop, it immediately disappears. That, oh, and no scent. Listen, do, when we eat a lot, do we gain a lot of weight or do we just no. like say No. I don't think so. We no. We can eat whatever we want. That's what and I we think. We can drink whatever we want. It's funny when we investigate and people like leave offerings of booze and they like open the booze up and they put it on the table. I'm like, that is such a tease. Take that <laughs> booze and pour it on the ground or pour it in a cup so that they can really smell it. Because if you oh, think yeah. about mm-hmm. it, scents are used in all kinds of religious mm-hmm. practices, right? So yep. the idea yep. is that the spirits can smell these things. So light that cigarette and let it blow for them. <laughs> pour that, open that bottle and pour it out a little bit so they can smell it, right? They might not be able to eat it, but take in those vapors. So oh I say, go for it, kids. Before we let you go, do you have any advice for maybe any of our listeners who want to get involved in the paranormal and don't know where to start? Uh, it's a hobby. Don't quit your day job. Let it just be a hobby because you, you know what I'm saying? Like have fun with it. Um, find like-minded people, even if it's online to uh, create your own little community where you can talk about ghosts and the paranormal without being looked at like a, with a side eye. It's getting better. <laughs> it's getting I think better. read books. Don't believe everything that you see on television. I mean, our show to me is the most straight up as you're going to get in in my opinion. I agree. So please watch Kindred Spirits, but even then like we're showing you the highlights. We're showing you the biggest things that have happened. There's so many other things that happen. So uh, get out in the world and go to spooky places. If you're not embracing the ghosts, embrace the history of the space. If ghosts get you into the venue and you're like, cool ghosts, but like really take in where you're standing and what the history is. Um, I think that's part of how amazing this could be like ghost hunting in general and like what it, what it should be. Is there anything we haven't touched on that you want to talk about? Everyone, please, please go get the book. You won't be disappointed if you get the book. Um, If you are, (laughs) you won't be, (laughs) if you, if you are though, uh, burn it and post about it and say that it's like from the devil so that all people start burning the book and buying it and burning it. Just, you know idea. what I'm saying? Like, if you hate it, <laughs> really start a ruckus. Really go in on me. That's a whole media strategy. <laughs> <laughs> Just go in hardcore. Um, I, I What I think what I want people to take away is like, the book, uh, There, it, it's a community. There, There's, I mean, I created a, a thing on Facebook called Goodbye, Hello, a community. It's a private group. So if you've read the book, or if you are going to read the book, and you want to join that community, you can. Uh, and it's full of people who are discussing topics in the book related to their lives. Some believe in ghosts, some don't, but they're all finding this kindred spirit in the ideas that are in the book, whether it's near death experiences or end of life, or what ghosts are, how they communicate, or why they're here, or dream visitations. There's something for everyone. When I was talking to my publisher about this right before it came out, and I was like, you know, we're going to have to do another one of these in like 10 years. And she was like, like, what? What?" And I was like, well, because what I think now, this is in this book. And then 10 years from now, 15 years from now, those ideas will change and evolve based on my experiences. That's what paranormal research is. Right. We may have to go back in sort of like tweakity tweak something. So for, for the now and for the next let's say 20 years i think this is a great stepping stone to better understanding our own journey on this earth and what might be next i love that thank you so much for coming on thank you that that was fun if you loved what you heard today please consider leaving us a review Death Becomes Us is an Emotional Pictures production produced by Sarah Nichols and Alex Eisenstein.